Serpent and Draconic symbolism are, without a doubt, one of the most pervasive myth themes across mythologies all over the world, such as in acting as progenitors of the world, like in the Babylonian tale of the god Marduk's slaying of the serpent Tiamat, whose corpse was torn apart to make the different parts of the world. They can also be guardians of secrets or something desirable, like in the treasure-guarding dragons of Western myths like Beowulf or Siegfried, who found mounds of treasure guarded by fire-breathing dragons. Alternatively, they can be seen as a part of nature, such as in Eastern myths like the god of the sea, Ryojin, who lives beneath the waves of the ocean. Myths about serpent and dragon-like entities exist in myth systems all over the world and have such a vast array of symbolic and narrative purposes, one would be hard pressed to thoroughly examine them all. Nowadays, dragons are a well-known motif in pop culture. They crop up in fantasy video game realms, tabletop campaigns, epic movies, and can inspire fear, intrigue, or adventure. And while dragons may have simply become a part of the pop culture landscape, many of them have retained their mythological significance. Today, we're going to examine one of those dragons as we delve into the world of Monster Hunter and examine the colossal fire dragon Zora Magdaros in what I assert is a modern day vegetation myth about the forces of nature that govern our own world. This is the mythology of Monster Hunter World. Greetings friends, my name is Opti, and today on Methods of Myth, we're going to be taking a look at the ecological mythology behind Monster Hunter World, Capcom's 2018 installment in their long-running, wyvern-flying, brute-smashing, elder dragon-tracking adventures, and personally, my favorite game in the series. I started the Monster Hunter series with Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate and continued on to Generations, and while loving both of these games to no end, I kind of always wanted a game that wasn't on handhelds so they would build a bigger world. So you can imagine how excited I was when Monster Hunter World was announced. Once I finally got my hands on it, I fell in love with what felt like a realized world with a vibrant ecosystem that teemed with life in a way that felt natural. And much to my surprise, I began to notice mythological undertones to the story surrounding Zora Magdaros the fire-spewing mountainous dragon that the expedition set out to trek across the vast ocean. And it is this titanic dragon that I assert is at the center of a vegetation myth that is reflective of our own modern view of ecology and the precarious balance within nature itself. And so I present to you, dear viewer, that Monster Hunter World is a modern-day vegetation myth that sets Zora Magdaros as its main figure for the renewal of the world itself. World taps into myths of the past about dragons and serpents being either the progenitors or the destroyers of the mythos they are set in. So that's what I'm here to examine, the mythology of Monster Hunter World and its vegetal fire dragon, Zora Magdaros. We're going to start with a brief overview of the plot of Monster Hunter World to not only act as a refresher for fans who might not have played the game in a while, but also for you folks who might not have played the game at all. Then we're going to talk about a specific type of myth called a vegetation myth, which is a myth related to the growth and death of natural flora, while also taking a brief look at some of the symbolism behind dragons. Then we'll talk about some real world ecology before tying all of this together to talk about how Monster Hunter World uses the common myth of the dragon to create a myth that reflects our relationship with nature. Without further ado, let's start by going over the lore of Monster Hunter World. And notice I said we're going to start with the lore, not mythology. While lore can lead us to mythology, Lore is not necessarily mythological in nature. Lore is merely the narrative storytelling aspect of a particular piece. While mythology certainly encompasses this part, mythology proper goes deeper than the surface, from simple recitation to examination. You can think of lore as being the hard data that we're going to sort through while mythology encompasses using this lore for deeper examination. 
We're going to take a deeper look at this relationship between lore and mythology later in another video. But for now, I just wanted to draw the line between what we are trying to do here in this video and simply retelling or reciting the lore of Monster Hunter World, although that is part of it, so people don't get the wrong idea of what the goal here is. But without further ado, let's talk about the lore of Monster Hunter World and set out on our journey with the Fifth Fleet. And fair warning, spoilers for the entire game lie ahead. On a bustling ship, merry with excitement at the crossing of a grand ocean in pursuit of knowledge, we find our Monster Hunter crossing the sea as part of the Fifth Fleet, the fifth generation of hunters to travel to what is dubbed as the New World, a land set far off from the familiar sights of previous games. And what knowledge are they seeking? That of the Elder Crossing, a mysterious migration of powerful monsters known as Elder Dragons. The Hunter's Guild, the governing body of monster research and hunting, has known about the Elder Crossing for centuries, yet it wasn't until the setting out of the first fleet of the Research Commission, due to advances in seafaring technology, that would make this possible. The first fleet set out across the ocean to establish a new base of operations, the Astera, which laid the groundwork for generations of researchers and hunters to come. Fast forward five generations, and here we are, landing, or rather crash landing in the new world. Right before landfall, Zora Magdaros, the main subject of the research commission and ours, rises from the water, toppling our hunter from the boat, leaving the crew to fend for themselves in the torrent of the ocean and us stranded on the back of Zora, a first fateful encounter to be sure. Once we catch a ride and arrive on the shores of the new world with our handler, the research and exploration driven brains to our hunter's combat driven brawn, the adventure begins taking us to the top of the great trees of the ancient forest, a thick forest teeming with life from the smallest toad to the biggest anginath. Then, venturing out into the wild spire wastes, a harsh desert dotted by towering crags where only the hardiest, most adaptive life can live. These deserts eventually give way to the Coral Highlands, a beautiful, fairy tale like landscape that looks like a coral reef and is home to some rather interesting new life. But just below the surface of this wonderland lies the Rotting Vale, a complex of twisting caverns filled with the rotting decay of creatures who have come to die. All along the way, we're doing our duty as a hunter in fending off attacks from rampaging monsters. Hunting monsters that seek to threaten the balance of ecosystem, discovering new life and hidden secrets within the new world, all in a day's work for a monster hunter. With each new area, the mystery that is Zora Magdaros and the Elder Crossing becomes clearer and clearer, as our hunter follows the discharged magma from Zora's carapace landing in each location. Eventually, the reason for the Elder Crossing is made clear. The Elder Dragons, powerful beings that can shape the very course of nature, come to the new world to die. When they feel the time is right, they travel to its depths, the Rotten Veil, vale, to give not only their body, but the biological energy they contain to help nourish the world. And with how vast the new world is, it stands to reason that something as massive as Zora Magdaros is the key to such an immense, diverse ecosystem. However, Zora is being drawn off course by something sinister, something unnatural that seeks to throw off the balance of the new world for its own promulgation. Eventually, the research commission realizes Zora is not heading for the Rotten Vale, but the Everstream, a ley line that runs beneath the earth carrying bioenergy in it. Should Zora die within the Everstream, it could mean the destruction of the New World. So the Commission mounts a defense to save the New World and Zora Magdaros from itself. It's after this battle that a fissure in the cave opens leading to the Elder's Recess. Other Elder Dragons begin to appear and are unnaturally drawn to this recess. 
further threatening the landscape with their destructive powers. Once again, we set out to discover other Elder Dragons who, like Zora, contain ecologically altering powers, like Kushala Diora, whose appearance may be tied to destructive weather patterns, or Val Hazak, who oozes a degenerative miasma that contributes to the decomposition happening in the Rotten Vale. The sudden appearance of all of these Elder Dragons is linked to an entity incubating within the Elder's recess. Finally, the cause of the increased frequency of the Elder Crossing, the sudden appearance of more Elder Dragons, and the luring of them away from their true resting place is revealed. Zeno Jiva, a juvenile Elder Dragon of incredible power, who was cocooned in a crystalline chrysalis, emitting a pheromone to lure Elder Dragons to die within the Elder Recess, so that it could feed off of their power. In one final battle, with the young yet powerful dragon, the hunter puts the ecological aberration to rest, ending the imbalance to the new world and setting nature right again. That is, for now. So before we get into constructing the vegetation myth that is Zora Magdaros, we need to ask the question, what is a vegetation myth? And well, this is a simple answer. A vegetation myth, sometimes lumped into or analogous to fertility myths, is a myth that is connected to the growth and death of vegetation through symbolism, allegory, or even explanation. These myths most commonly depict a deity whose death or entrance into the underworld signals the recession of a land's vegetation, and it is often their return to the world in one way or another that causes nature to flourish once again. To give an example you might know of, the tale of Persephone from Greek mythology is an example of a vegetation myth. Hades, ruler of the Greek underworld, falls in love with Persephone and abducts her. Persephone's mother, Demeter, walks all over the earth looking for her, and for various reasons depending on the tradition, she prevents vegetation from growing. Eventually, Zeus, ruler of the Greek gods of Olympus, calls for Persephone's return. Hades agrees to return Persephone, but not before having her eat the seed of a pomegranate that was grown in the underworld. And because Persephone eats the seeds of this pomegranate, she must return to Hades on a yearly basis, during which time Earth's flora begins to die once again. Here, we have a myth that relates its characters to the vegetation of the land. Another example would be that of the Egyptian god of Osiris, who was tricked by his brother Set into getting into a coffin, and after a series of events was dismembered and scattered all around Egypt, all before being resurrected into the underworld by his wife. In numerous different cults to Osiris, his death, dismemberment, and resurrection was associated with the planting, growing, and the harvesting of crops, and even in some instances with the rising of the Nile River during the fertile growing seasons. Now, let's think about Zora Magdaros. We have a monolithic, dragon-like creature that travels across the world in a march that is its death knell. Within its massive body is stored a bioenergy which the story does not explain, but it merely hints at being an unseen force that permeates and helps maintain the land. Zora is the active participant in this myth, the Osiris or Persephone as it were, whose character is that of death and rebirth that signals the renewal of life over the land. At this point an apt question might be, uh, how can Zora Magdaros be a mythical vegetation figure when they're not some god or some kind of demi-human? In fact, one could argue that Zora is nothing special within the bounds of Monster Hunter lore at all. Uh, no more out of place than a white stag amongst a normal herd, uh, a biological anomaly and exception to less rare creatures from within the series, certainly. But speaking from within Monster Hunter's own bounds of logic, Zora Magdros is basically a giant freaking lizard. Well, myths don't need to be just about gods or heroes at all. 
Rather, myths speak to long-running and strongly held human beliefs that human beings craft stories around. I'll refer you to our Redefining Mythology video for more on that. Zora Magdaros might not be a god, but Zora is part of a classification of creatures within Monster Hunter known as Elder Dragons. Elder Dragons are creatures that are so powerful that their mere existence can change the course of nature itself. While not deific, Zora is certainly abnormally powerful within the confines of its own universe. And there's also a really important aspect of Zora to explore. A mythological one, in fact. It's the fact that Zora Magdaros is an elder dragon. Dragon symbolism is an incredibly wide subject due to how pervasive dragons are through the history of mythology. They appear nearly everywhere and mean different things depending on which mythological tradition they show up in. We could go on and on checking boxes as to Zora's relationship to draconic myth themes, but I've selected just a few to go over that I think are interesting and relevant to Zora's depiction as a mythical dragon. But first off, we have the notion of dragons as elemental being. They can come to harness, embody, or connect to different elements in nature. Immediately, one might think of the Western version of dragons, which breathe fire and nest in dens within the earth, while Eastern dragons are often associated with water while dwelling beneath the waves or acting as the clouds that bring rain. Both traditions, of course, posit dragons as possessing flight. Within the symbol of the dragon, we have the coalescence of the elemental forces of nature, all in one symbolic serpentine being, either by the very elements they contain within their bodies or by the places they dwell. Zora's status as an elder dragon within Monster Hunter World is not only apt from the standpoint of it being in the most dangerous scientific classifications of monsters from within the Monster Hunter World universe, but it also perfectly describes Zora as a mythical figure. From its first moments, it's not hard to tell that Zora Magdaros harnesses the element of fire, with its rugged, volcanic back that spews lava. But I'd actually venture even further to suggest it comes to embody the three other elements of air, earth, and water as well. Water because of its apparent ability to submerge itself, moving beneath the ocean before emerging in the game's opening. Earth, not only because it walks on the earth, appearing to be flightless, but also because of its shell on its back being made out of, or at least resembling, solidified lava, making Zora Magdros part moving landmass. I also find it poignant to point out that Zora is carrying a literal landmass on its back while also, metaphorically, carrying the weight of the new world as it marches towards its death. And air is a bit of an interesting one. Originally, I was going to merely assert that Zora's massive, towering size shows his connection to air or the sky, and I would still add that. But I also found out while writing the script that Zora Magdaros has wings. I own two SKUs of this game, have put well over 100 odd hours into it, farmed Zora for like 10 of those, and I never even once saw or conceived of this being a thing. But apparently, Zora has wings that seemingly act like appendages to carry its shell around on its back. Vestigial or not, the inclusion of wings in Zora's design adds credence with a connection to the sky. Another important aspect I'd like to touch on is the connection dragons have to serpent imagery and symbolism. In fact, over time, dragons came to embody many of the mythological principles that serpents have as well, probably because of their serpent-like appearance. For example, dragons and serpents often represent the cyclicality of things like time or life and death. Their presence in a story may be symbolic of these aspects. Take our intro example of Tiamat's death issuing forth the beginning of the physical world. Or on the opposite side of things, we can look at the stirring of the world serpent Jormander, 
being one of the heralds to the Norse cataclysm of Ragnarok. On one hand, we have the beginning and the other, the end. But in both cases, we have a relation of a serpent creature with the passage of time. Zora takes on these cyclical qualities, albeit on a less cosmic scale as Tiamat as a creation myth or Jormundur as an apocalyptic myth, Zora's position is, again, vegetative. Its placement within the story of Monster Hunter World posits it as a vegetation figure within a myth. Its death heralds the beginning of a new cycle of empowered, renewed life for the new world. Placing emphasis on the cyclicality of life and death as it happens in nature, and actually bringing about another important point about Monster Hunter World's mythical aspects, which is that it reflects real world ecology in the way its monsters, flora, fauna, and even humans interact with one another. One of the most fascinating aspects about Monster Hunter World is its parallels to aspects of real world ecology, that is, the understanding of how organisms and their environments interact. Monster Hunter as a series has always had a modicum of logic to the way monsters inhabit their environments. Flying monsters like the Rathian and Rathalos often have their perches or nests. Amphibious monsters like the Tetsukabra or Yorotodus dwell in areas where they have access to both land and water. More hardened creatures like the Diablos can be found in desert environments. Monsters even take on a predator and prey roles in relation to one another, creating a food chain. But World takes that theme one step further with emphasizing the areas monsters call home, while also introducing new ecological aspects to its world building. Endemic life is one of these new additions, which added smaller, non-monster, non-crafting material creatures that can serve a gameplay purpose like the Paratoad, which when struck will let out a cloud of paralyzing gas you can either take advantage of yourself or fall prey to if you're not careful. While there are towering behemoths walking around, other endemic life just simply exists around you. World also added Turf Wars, which are absolutely incredible moments when two large monsters meet with each other and fight on a territorial basis, much like animals do in real life to establish dominance or territorial boundaries. What's more is actually I was originally going to talk about how nature is self-regulating, that when something goes wrong, nature has mechanisms that can help it self-recover. E.g. a fire can burn down a massive swath of woods, killing wildlife, taking their homes away, and causing a disruption to the ecosystem. But then plants can reclaim that land and animals can repopulate. This is known as the balance of nature. And I initially thought to use this approach because of a creature called Nergigante, who pops up at key points throughout the story whenever we're on the trail for a dangerous elder dragon. At first, it seems like Nergigante is a destructive creature who is sowing chaos into an already troubled world. However, we find out from the Iceborne DLC that Nergigante is actually not some evil force, but is here to hunt down the cause of the New World's disruptive forces. They're actually here to act as a balancing force of nature against the disruptive force that is Xenojiva and later Shara Ishvalda. However, it turns out that the idea of the balance of nature is actually false. And I found this out while actually researching this piece and had to re-educate myself. In fact, ecologists have rejected this view and have been urging the public to reject this view since the middle of the 20th century. Nature does not in fact balance itself, but is actually always in flux, a term coined by Dr. Stuart Pickett. Nature does have ways to adapt to critical situations, but it's entirely possible for factors in an ecological system to completely destroy and affect nature in permanently negative ways. Take invasive species, for example. When certain species of plants, insects, fish, or animals are introduced into an environment, they can cause irreparable damage. 
natural disasters, human negligence like overhunting, and even climate change have led to the extinction of entire species and irreparable destruction of ecosystems. In fact, nature cannot always heal itself, and so human intervention is even required at times. There's a wealth of research online about this phenomenon, but I'll actually leave a few links to National Geographic, the Ecology Society of America, and an in-depth article published by the National Center for Biotechnology Information below, so you can get a decent idea as to why nature is not necessarily balanced, but ever-changing. The reason I bring all of this up is because Monster Hunter World actually takes this idea of nature in flux to heart rather than the idea of nature in balance, further adding to the ways in which Monster Hunter World utilizes real-world ecology. There are examples of invasive species, such as the first time a Puke Puke wanders out of its habitat in the ancient forest, out into the wild spire wastes, or the introduction of variant creatures like the Pink Rathian. There's also permanent environmental changes to the new world as more powerful monsters emerge as Xenojiva gets closer to awakening, forever altering the ecosystem and contenders in the food chain. In each instance, our hunter is sent out to either figure out why this is happening or even hunt the monsters themselves to prevent further destruction to the ecosystem, further emphasizing the necessity of human intervention. For without the expedition, the New World's chance at ecological stability would have been put in jeopardy. Bringing everything back around to our vegetation figure, Zora Magdaros, who stands as the focal point for all this information. Zora is our reason for digging deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the New World. Its journey to the Rotten Vale so that it may die and fertilize the land is also a prime example of the decomposition cycle of our own world, but has the added fantastical quality of bioenergy, which further adds to Zora's mythical quality. It is because of the expedition's need to address not only the mystery of Zora Magdaros, but the mystery of how the New World functions, that we unravel a world that runs on our own understanding of ecology. It's actually fascinating when you take a step back and look at how organic an ecological system Capcom crafted with a world full of monsters. Every creature, big or small, has its logical place in the environment and food chain. Monsters exhibit behaviors analogous to real-world animals, but still maintain their consistency to form as well monsters. And the environments they exist in are believable, if not mere exaggerations, of how nature can work in our world. So what does all of this have to do with mythology? Well, one of mythology's functions is to help us understand the world around us through a creative effort. By creating an allegorical story, a mythmaker can help convey a given societal understanding of how our world functions. But rather than it be a textbook, it's a story. This is a point that's actually brought up by mythographer Joseph Campbell, who states that one of the functions of a living myth is to offer an image of the universe that will be in accord with the knowledge of the time, the sciences, and the fields of action of the folk to whom the mythology is addressed. This point is later echoed by folklorist William Doty, whose definition of myth discusses that myths frequently reinforce a tribe's learned ecological adaptations to its natural context. Tribe here meaning society. So simply put, myths often borrow from a given group's understanding of science to help craft a story's basis for their world building. We often use these stories to discuss our connection to the natural world around us and what our duty or function within it is. When we consider that we're looking at Monster Hunter World as a vegetation myth, we are seeing an allegory for a real world understanding of ecology as a vastly interconnected and chaotic system. We are thrown from our ship into a world that is more like our own than initially thought. There's a food chain. Monsters all have evolutionary adaptations that make sense for either traversing their environment or defending themselves or their territory. We have life of all shapes and sizes interacting with one another. This is an ordering of a world that is akin to our own, 
And so we have a mythological analog that makes use of a modern scientific understanding of how creatures, their environment, and humans interact with each other. So now that we have all the parts we need, it's time to put this myth together. In constructing this myth, it's important that we start at the beginning of our journey when we first encounter Zora Magdaros gradually emerging from the waters below that becomes an archetypally significant event. Water being an archetypal symbol for the unconscious or the unknown is fitting as our pursuit of Zora is a quest for the unknown. Why is it migrating to the new world of all places? What do we learn along the way in our pursuit of this monolithic dragon? How does this dragon relate to the world it so seemingly is unconscious of in its unrelenting journey? And what is Zora's place in our journey of discovery? It's a quest of discovery of the new world, and as our many guides along the way say, for the mystery it contains. It becomes apparent the further you progress that the new world is a thriving ecosystem, one that takes pains to recreate our own understanding of ecology, but in a fantasy setting. It has a semblance of a food chain with the increasingly powerful monsters. Creatures all have evolutionary adaptations to traverse their environments, defend their territory, hunt, or to ward off predators. Much like a real-world ecology system. But also much like a real-world ecological system, this is a world and a precarious balance that can be thrown off by elements that are created by nature itself. Xenojiva, while seemingly some evil force, is just another creature like any other monster in this world. It's simply behaving as it's naturally supposed to. But even if it's not malevolent, its introduction into the new world is cause for human intervention to fight off encroaching elder dragons and other invasive species from doing unimaginable damage to the ecosystem. Which is an amazing example of the idea of nature as a system in flux. And we owe these discoveries to our myth's central figure, Zora Magdaros. Each mainline mission, and even just some careful observation of the game world on one's own, can lead to all sorts of new discoveries. But all of this discovery is linked to our pursuit of Zora Magdaros. While we may be dealing with an Anjanath getting too close to human encampments in one mission, or establishing a camp in another, eventually our reason to keep pushing forward into the new world and investigating is to find out Zora's end goal. While we're out traipsing around the world, Zora is an ever-present force that acts as a guiding beacon for the expedition's efforts and curiosity. Even after Zora's departure halfway through the base game, it still is the reason we find the Elder Recess and Xenojiva the destructive force that pulled Zora away from its final resting place. All signs point to Zora Magdaros. And in pointing to Zora Magdaros, we find a symbol that embodies the mythological dragon. Within its character lies an amalgamation of the elements of fire, of earth, of water, of the sky all together in a figure that is destined to finally lay itself to rest and give its energy back to the land. And in its death, once again, mimicking what we know of nature and the decomposition cycle, it comes to take on the qualities of primordial serpents of mythology as they relate to renewal and cyclicality. It's self-dying so that the world might be renewed. Monster Hunter and Zora Magdarost stand as a vegetation myth reflecting a modern scientific understanding of ecology. From the standpoint of scientific discovery, it shows us that we can rely on certain observable principles to grasp an understanding of the world around us, but it also shows us our place in it. That while we might feel so small in the unrelenting march of nature's fury and persistence through time, we can still enact change. Not only can we, but we must if we want to ensure the continued safety of the environment and its inhabitants. So we have two loose ends we need to address. One is the actual ending of Zora Magdras. Here's the thing. 
Zora doesn't actually die in the game. Uh, we never see Zora reach the Rotten Vale to die and help nourish the land. What happens is that we push Zora out to sea so that it doesn't die in the wrong place and cause ecological damage. And then it comes back every so often in a random event so that we have the chance to farm its materials and craft its related armor set. This is a gameplay contrivance though. It's one of those moments when a video game will have to make a concession for the sake of gameplay. If Zora did manage to make it to the Rotten Vale and die in game, well, it'd just be weird to be able to suddenly have Zora stomping around again. Also, we know that there is more than one Zora Magdaros, as we find the bones of one in the Guiding Lands from the Iceborne DLC, showing us that long ago another Zora died to help create another landmass. So it stands to reason that the Zora Magdaros of our game will eventually come to rest and decompose to be a part of the land. And speaking of the DLC, you might be asking, what about that, Opti? Well, I actually went through and looked at all the cutscenes, the dialogue, and the monsters from that, and there really isn't actually that much relevant to the myth we've constructed here, outside of maybe the aforementioned Zora Bones and the interaction between Ruiner Nergigante and Shara Ishvalda, the big bad of that game, or DLC as it were. The base game stands on its own. Zora's story is told and put to rest, and I'm sort of treating Iceborne relating Worlds base game like how the Odyssey relates to the Iliad. While they're related to each other, they both stand on their own and have their own stories to be told. Uh, don't worry, we'll probably be talking about Iceborne a bit later down the road. And there you have it, my friends. There's the mythology behind the fire dragon Zora Magdaros, and a brief look into some of the mythology that pops up in Monster Hunter World. I know there's even more stuff I could have added, like how there are Dolomadur corpses in the Guiding Lands and the Rotten Vale that further add to the whole decomposition slash creation cycle, or all of the new species that get introduced in High Rank or Master Rank. There's also the case of Shara Ishvalda basically becoming another ecological disaster, but I wanted to keep things relatively brief. Plus, I've actually got a few more things that I'd like to analyze in the world, like possible connections to real-world hunting rituals, as well as an archetypal analysis of Xenojiva and Zora Magdaros, but I think I'll end things here. This video has gone on long enough already. If there's anything you think I missed, could stand to add, or if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If there's a need to address all this, I might just do a follow-up video for this one in due time. I also want to give a brief shout out to some friends who helped me through this. Squisher Doodles, Yokai Loki, and Democracy all helped bring me through the game so that I could see everything myself. Squish also helped me hammer out a lot of the lore as well. Go give their Twitch pages a follow. I'll leave links in the description below. They're all delightful people and people I'm blessed to call my friends. Also, be sure to follow me on other social media. I am always active on Twitter and I stream regularly on Twitch. I also want to give just a brief shout out to all of my Kofi subs who have helped keep this funded over the few months that I've been working on it. I just want to say thank you all so much. I know it was a rather long period of time and there was a lot of talking about it, but finally it's here. And if you in the future want to help support these projects, the Kofi is the best way to do it. 100% of the proceeds go directly to me. There's no fees for you or for myself and it helps me keep focused and buy materials that I need, anything from research to equipment to be able to make these videos. So thank you so much to everybody who supported me at any point in time since we basically started this. My friends, I appreciate you very much. Check out the link in the description if you'd like to know more, and you can actually get videos ahead of time and also know ahead of time what I'm working on even outside of just these things that you see here. With that, my friends, let's take it one last time. But before I go, I submit this to you. The story of Zora Magdaros is one that compels us to think about our place in nature. We often think of nature as being set in balance, almost as if in stasis. We believe that it can work to maintain itself. All we have to do is watch it go its natural course. But while nature is resilient, even ferocious, it sometimes needs help to reach not a precarious balance, but a strong foundational stability. One that takes into account all the ways it can help itself heal. And all the ways 
it might succumb to destruction. Until next time, my friends, be safe and be loved.